Thank you, Jan and Steve. As you know, um, for the last seven years, um, our annual dinner has also been associated with the uh, Joanne Berkeley Symposium. That event takes place tomorrow on the campus of KCUMB, our osteopathic school of medicine. Our generous sponsors, including KCUMB and the Uni University of Missouri Kansas City School of Medicine, will um, also be sponsoring that event. We still have a few slots left over, so if you uh, don't have anything to do tomorrow, I know it's supposed to be beautiful, but you can probably skip the golf outing and join us for, the, for a good day um, at KCUMB. And it only costs you $95. I, I failed to mention that um, it's our tradition uh, for our awardees, our Vision to Action awardees, to um, award them with scholarships in their name to the Center Certificate Program in Clinical Ethics and Health Policy, and we'll proudly do that this year for both Steve and Jan. I'd like for you now to uh, take a moment and open the booklet that was on your seat uh, when you came in. If you grab your program, a couple things I'd like to point out. You uh, heard earlier that we're in the process of developing a stories project. Um, in your, at your table, you probably may have a couple of repeats, but there should be, I think, a total of 15 different stories that we've been circulating from many of our friends and benefactors. If you would like to be able to participate in a storytelling that you feel uh, particularly important to you, just leave your business card on the table or take one of the envelopes that are on the table, write a note to us and say that you'd like us to follow up with you and make sure that your story gets told and included in our, our group of stories that we're going to be uh, putting together over the course of the next year. As a token of our appreciation for your joining us this evening, uh, we have a wonderful gift for you. Helen Emmett's new book, entitled Without Regrets, is uh, also available for each household, if you'll pick one up on your way out the door. Uh, David and Helen have made a generous donation of sharing their touching and intimate stories of shared decision-making and sound practical advice. If you know either of them, you know that they are very, very committed to sound practical advice on how big families, uh, large and small, actually, uh, can participate um, through all the struggles and tears and laughter that goes along with shared decision making uh, in making decisions without regrets. Those will be available in the back of the room, as I mentioned. Please make sure that you pick one up on your way home as a thanks for your joining us this evening. We'd also like to invite all of you who are thinking about planning and we're sure that all of you do that, uh, otherwise you wouldn't be here tonight, to remember the Center's Legacy Society. We are planning to add 30 in honor of our anniversary celebration this year to that growing list of some two dozen folks who have already made commitments to a legacy gift to the Center um, upon their passing. Finally, we come to the special moment in the evening that we've all been waiting to hear. Our featured presenter, who will be sharing her poignant story of love and caregiving. This presentation is made possible by those who honor the memory of Robert Biblo, a respected health plan leader who died an untimely death at the age of 61. Dr. Margaret Batten is a philosopher, ethicist, writer, teacher, and researcher. Her extensive work over decades in the area of end-of-life decision-making involves fascinating work in studying how patients and families deal with the challenges of death. From the depths of religious and spiritual world to the often deceptive and troubling concerns around assisted dying, euthanasia, suicide, and even martyrdom. She, she has explored these issues not only in the United States, but beyond in Europe and Asia, in modern and in ancient cultures. Her keen insights and incredible depth on her view into this world of dying provided a vantage point for her, an unparalleled one, when her husband, Brooke, suffered a devastating accident, which you will hear about this evening. I've had the wonderful pleasure of hearing Peggy speak before. What's, what struck me most, though, in her exquisite storytelling were three things. The first was intimacy. The experience of what it means to say, I love you, and to say goodbye. 
Regardless of how scared, vulnerable, and excited, we all know the feeling of what it means to say, I love you. The second is dignity, how important the human experience is, how regardless of capacity, energy, strength, vim, or vigor, our devotion and conviction stretches us beyond boundaries that we ever thought possible in those that we love at the edge of life. And thirdly, integrity. What does wholeness mean to us, especially those of us who are asked to do things for others that we find hard or stretch us or raise the specter of doubt or fear? So as we are drawn into this story of Peggy and Brooke this evening, think about those three things, intimacy, dignity, and integrity. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peggy Batten. <clears throat> Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's, it's customary, good evening, on these occasions to thank the leaders of an organization, Myra and John, and to um, thank many of the interesting and um, influential people I've met here. And it's customary to praise the organization and to say what a wonderful thing the center is. And I mean to do all those things, and I do them now, but there's one other thing I'd like to acknowledge, and that is, as I have talked to many people, and of course know in general, there are many, many stories out there, like Steve's about his father, that are sources of continuing anguish and also, one might say, celebration and joy that are out there in this audience. And as we talk, we must remember that all of us share in these things. So thank you, I'm, I'm extremely happy to be here and thank you for coming. Now I'd like to um, See if this will. Could we have the slides? Back there. <laughs> Is our tech group here? There we go. Okay. I'd like to tell you the story of uh, a little boy named Brooke Hopkins, who grew up to be um, a college professor. There he is at. Um, in his assistant professor days at Harvard, and that's the uh, daughter of the colleague who's taking the picture. And then he moved to Utah, where he fell in love. And so did I. His field was uh, English literature. He, he especially was interested in the romantic poets, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Keats, you know, those folks, Shelley. And my field was philosophy. Of course, there wasn't any bioethics field when I first began. That was just coming into being. But as time went on, uh, end-of-life issues came to the fore, issues about death and dying, as John has uh, pointed out to you. I've worked on topics like assisted suicide, euthanasia. And we talked about that we had a very nice life together. We traveled extensively. Uh, in all those little interstices in the academic year. And as we traveled, we talked about everything. We talked about romantic poetry, but we also talked about death and dying issues. As we traveled, as we lived our lives together, and we knew a lot of, we talked about a lot of things over the years. So for, for example, we knew a lot about partly because of his historical interests and mine as well. We knew a lot about transitions in the way people uh, die. We knew that people, for instance, before somewhere around uh, the middle of the 19th century, up until then, people had died typically suddenly without much warning. 
largely unpredictably. This could occur at any time in life, from infancy uh, through the middle years, in childbirth, in um, many other circumstances. And uh, in particular, the physician couldn't do very much about it beyond comfort. Uh, earlier, in this earlier stage of the, what's known as the epidemiologic uh, transition, people died largely of infectious and parasitic uh, diseases. If you can read that list there, you'll see that virtually all of them, um, uh, n influenza, pneumonia, uh, and so on, are infectious diseases that might sweep through a population, might come in epidemics or pandemics, uh, or exacerbated by um, cycles of malnutrition. But this is what people died of, and it could happen uh, any time. That changed over the next century or so as uh, immunization, uh, water um, cleanliness, um, sanitation procedures, um, the discovery, the recognition of the germ theory of disease. As physicians learned to wash their hands between seeing patients, only took a century between Semmelweis and uh, when that became uh, widespread, uh, and many other advanced technologies, we have begun to die of quite different uh, diseases, what are called by epidemiologists the delayed degenerative diseases, heart disease, cancer, stroke, organ failure, neurologic diseases, uh, which involve comparatively slow, long downhill slopes. They're comparatively predictable. They occur typically at later points in life. Childhood mortality, of course, has gone way down, but so has early uh, adolescent uh, and midlife mortality. And of causes, and this is particularly important to the work of the center, of causes that the physician can do quite a lot to stave off. Right? That's the change in how we've died. Uh, and we're familiar in our travels and in our talks all the time with the ways our societies, and this is true in most of the developed world, have of uh, dealing with or negotiating these ways of dying from things that will be familiar to you, DNR orders, withholding and withdrawing treatment, uh, refusal of treatment by competent patients, the double effect uh, methods of um, uh, utilizing high dose, higher doses of opioids than might be necessary, and so on. This is a list that you can see here of the ways in which we have, um, since about the 1960s, come to deal with our longer trajectories of dying. The t ones at the top were originally controversial when they were first um, became matters of public uh, awareness. Uh, and over time, we've gone down this list so that uh, practices like um, uh, withholding and withdrawing uh, both artificial nutrition and hydration uh, the use of terminal sedation uh, have become now matters of accepted medical practice. And even in the uh, four or five states listed here, even uh, arms, what I like to call arm's length, um, provision by a physician of lethal medications to a um, terminally ill patient. There are other controversial practices which are not legally recognized but uh, practiced anyway, everywhere that's been surveyed. But these are the ways we have come to um, meet death in our modern healthcare system. Of course, all the time we were talking about this, we were having a good time. I'm at the other end of this camera. All this talk about death with long tail offs didn't seem relevant on this occasion. These are mountains in Yugoslavia and there are 5,000 foot drop offs right beyond that corner. Actually, when this picture was taken, I thought it might be the last picture on a camera found in a deep ravine somewhere years later. We knew Joanne Lynn's famous uh, slide. This is um, her depiction of the um, pr likely curves for the three principal kinds of um, end-of-life scenarios. This is for um, 
people over 65 generally. Uh, and while this slide's a little older, she said uh, just the other day, well, nothing has changed about them except that the tails grow longer. The top one is cancer, typically a condition in which one is in pretty good shape until quite a steep and rapid uh, drop-off. Uh, then um, various kinds of organ failure in which what you see is exacerbations and remissions, exacerbations and remissions uh, until but always trending downhill until finally one of them proves fatal. And then the uh, lower trajectory of um, the uh, various dementias uh, common in old age. This is the picture that we face in the developed world. Uh, the vast majority of us, and that includes uh, the vast majority of us right now in this room. It isn't, however, how Brooke died. All the time we were talking about this, we were having a pretty good time. Uh, we uh, were asked to identify this. Uh, some of you know there was a story in the Times, uh, New York Times magazine about us. They had found this, gotten this picture from us, and then they wanted to know where it was taken and when. So we had a very difficult time identifying it uh, because there are a lot of cafes around the world that look like this and a lot of places you can sit and uh, chat and have a comfortable beer. We did figure, because our hair looked so peculiar, that we had probably been swimming in salt water right before this is, was taken, but that's as close as we could get to them. So they labeled it Peggy and Brooke on vacation. We also knew in all our discussions that uh, the problem, as we saw it with issues about uh, death and dying, was that many, and it's tempting to say most, of our deepest cultural, political, <coughs> religious traditions were formed originally before and indeed often well before that beginning of the epidemiologic transition when we went from dying rap comparatively rapidly, suddenly, and unpredictably, um, and un in a way that couldn't be um, much ameliorated by medicine, to the ways we die now, right? We died of those uh, diseases with um, character characteristically long uh, downhill courses, those traditions that had formed so much earlier in Greece, in among the ancient Hebrew traditions, through the Middle Ages, into the early modern period and so on, didn't and don't, I think, provide us, they're not very well adapted to the kinds of decision making that we now are in the position of doing both for others and for ourselves. Our cultural foundations are part of what I think our challenges include. Then things changed. This is November 2008. Brooke, a extraordinarily vigorous, healthy, um, wonderfully intelligent, kind, decent, understanding guy with whom I'd shared a life for many, many years, had gone biking, a bike route that he had gone on many times. Normally I went with him, but that particular day I happened to have a kind of a bad cold, and so I went to these two lectures in the philosophy department. They happened to be one was more boring than the other, but uh, so I didn't know what had happened. This is the scene from the um, news helicopter overhead. He had collided coming downhill around a, a blind curve with a bike racer, a very vigorous biker, going uphill around a blind curve. Nobody saw this occur, uh, although the guy coming uphill right behind the bike racer heard the snap of one of the carbon fiber bikes breaking in half. The other guy wasn't hurt, he was just tossed off. But downhill was coming a 
This is a very heavily used canyon road used by lots of people. And downhill was jogging a fully trained flight nurse whose specialty was respiratory therapy. She recognized immediately what had happened. She obviously was there within moments. Uh, began uh, resuscitation, but she recognized at the time what had happened, that he had a very high spinal cord injury. He'd gone over, landed on his helmet. The helmet was completely smashed in, but he had no head injury. But he had um, a spinal cord injury at C2, C3. So that, of course, affected breathing as well as all the rest of the um, limbs in the body. And um, she saved his life. She said afterwards, when we finally discovered who she was and met her, she said, I don't know whether I did the right thing. He had signed a living will. There it is. It's like all those other boilerplate living, living wills. No tubes, no machines, no none of this. Right? But of course it wasn't with him and he had no ID and uh, so nobody knew he, who he was for some number of hours. Right? And in any case, in an emergency situation like this, this would probably not have been uh, respected. This designates me as his surrogate decision maker, as I had designated him. Had I been there, what would I have done? Would I have said, just slow down. Just, just don't bother. Right? After all, there was someone there fully trained who knew what had happened and what the downhill consequences of it would be. Would I have said that? I don't know. In any case, um, here he is in the hospital. You'll see the ventilator. Uh, he is here in bed, um, fully paralyzed uh, from the tops of the shoulders down and completely dependent on uh, various kinds of life support. However, he was extraordinarily glad to be, to be alive. And when we finally met the uh, flight nurse, it was about four months, took us four months to figure out who she was, with a little help from all our various medical friends, he thanked her profusely for having rescued him. They actually became quite good friends. He spent a couple of years, two years and two weeks, in various inpatient settings, right? Not counting all the later admissions. And while he was inpatient, he developed quite close relationships with many of the caregiving staff. These happened to be two physical therapists, uh, but there were many other people in the inpatient and uh, skilled nursing facility settings that he lived in for so long including respiratory therapists, aides, um, nurses, even the custodial staff from time to time, although they were so overworked, they really uh, had time to sit. That was enormously important to him uh, during this time uh, in these facilities. Even after he came home, right, and we had our own uh, self-hired home care 24-7 staff, right, those relationships came to be extraordinarily important. You'll see here a collection of the, uh, we usually had uh, about 12 people working with Brooke at a time. The four in the front and the one whose face is hidden are all uh, respiratory therapists. Uh, the one on the far right in the back row is a CNA with uh, about seven years of experience. The two guys in the back are um, uh, pre-med students, and the guy on the far left was a drywaller, right? He'd been working on our house while we were doing uh, the many modifications necessary for coming home. Uh, he would said, you know, the drywall industry is collapsing. I'm thinking of going into medicine, so the hospital trained him, and he became one of our best staff. <laughs> the dog, however, didn't play a role. <laughs> These were wonderful people, but we learned the first of the three lessons I want to bring to you from them, that there's a really piece of, a, a piece of really bad medical advice out there, 
which is taught, as far as I can see, to many healthcare providers at every level, don't make friends with patients, right? It's a bad le lesson for healthcare providers, and it's a bad lesson for patients. The rapport and concern and indeed love between Brooke and the many people who cared for them, not cared for him, not everyone of course, but was extraordinarily important in his survival and thriving. So that distanced posture, we thought, was not good. So our second lesson comes from being home. Here he is with his sister on our front porch. You can see his um, standing wheelchair. He's very tall, and um, this standing chair exaggerated that a little bit. Um, there he is. He was able to do something that many people wouldn't have been, if completely paralyzed, able to do. That is, continue with his uh, professional activities. He, he was a university professor. They use, you know, speech and reading. He taught the Iliad, the Odyssey, all those things you read at various points in your you know, early um, academic careers. He taught them all. Those are huge, long books. He had devoted students. And this was flourishing, flourishing. We had fun. People came over to play um, music in our backyard. We laughed. Right, and we even managed to get out into the countryside. That's a, um, a contraption called a trail rider, uh, invented by the uh, former mayor of Vancouver. Um, it's got a sort of basket, wheelbarrow kind of wheel underneath, and two Sherpas on each end. And we were able to go out into the um, wonderful Utah wilderness. But we also did something new together. And this is often a problem in um, dramatic changes in life situations like that, that the relationships that you've had before were founded on some joint activity, like traveling, as you've seen we had done a lot of, or um, playing, oh, I don't know, sports. You have friends that you go biking with, or play tennis with, or swim with, or do any of a number of different things, all of those things have to change because one of the parties can't do it anymore. But what we did and what actually was enormously important to us was to keep a blog, right? We kept this running account of the interior experience that was essential, particularly to Brooke but to both of us. It's about continuity, he said. There's an odd way in which the change, in which the, despite the disastrous break in my life, this accident has met, has meant it's somehow connected with the concerns of one of the poets I admi admire the most, Wordsworth, and his conception of the growth of the poet's mind. This is a major element in, um, uh, romantic uh, thought. He talks about Wordsworth and Wordsworth's transformation as a, in, the, in the aftermath of the failure of the French Revolution. The real challenge for me, he says, has been in trying to expand my mind enough to comprehend my own catastrophe without letting it become that way. I've tried this is a man who is now completely paralyzed. I've tried to just let it be part of me, part of who I'm becoming, and to always keep in mind how extraordinarily much I've gained, not just what I've lost. So our second lesson, and we talked about this a lot, is the notion that it's only a tragedy if you make it that way. There's the obvious physical fact that a dramatic and what would ordinarily be called devastating injury has occurred, that it won't be repairable, 
that someone's complete physical functioning has come to an end. But that doesn't mean you have to see it as a tragedy. He taught us, or we taught each other, that we could look at the positive elements in terms of the deepening of relationships, both in family contexts and in other relationships outside, and many, many other things that emerged from this difficult situation. I started by saying, well, in thanking the hosts here, the thing that we really need to remember is the many stories out here, the many um, experiences that are analogous to this in all their myriad ways, right? And so I know that you know how big a role one's own perception of what's happened plays in what it is and what it feels like and how um, important it is to keep one's mind on the deeper and more positive aspects of these things as well. That's lesson two. He flourished for four years, I think. There were many, you know, intermediate infections and trips to the hospital and uh, all kinds of complications and uh, running a small home-based one-bed hospital is not exactly a, a um, not exactly child's play. One realizes the complexity of all the various services you need, c infection control and so on. But after a while, the toll of this accident began to play a much bigger role and things began to go downhill. Lesson three follows right away. You need a physician who listens to you, who understands you, and who becomes your ally, your helpmeet, your partner, your friend in how to die. How to die? Oh, he knew what he wanted. He wanted to be able to die when he was ready. He wanted to be able to die with the help of a physician. He wanted to be able to die without pain or suffering or because he had respiratory, uh, dramatic respiratory difficulties without air hunger. He wanted to be able to die at home and he wanted to be able to have his family and his friends around him. And he wanted to be able to die. I think this was his wish, it was certainly mine, with the one who loved him most, lying by his side. But by this time he had five technologies keeping him alive. He had a diaphragm pacer that kept him um, assisted with breathing. He had a cardiac pacer. He had a feeding tube, that's a nasal tube, but he actually had a peg tube uh, by this time. He had external oxygen, that's our uh, closet right off the bedroom. And he had a ventilator. There is uh, just a part of our respiratory department uh, in home care. He wrote a letter. This letter was dated 2012 in the summer, explaining to people why he was choosing not to continue, um, saying he knew it would be difficult for them, but that he was coming to the end. This letter was written actually but he never mailed this letter. Uh, and it wasn't until a year later that he actually died. He also knew exactly what he didn't want. He didn't want to die in the hospital. He didn't want a sterile environment. He didn't want distanced people. He didn't want the end of life um, routine, um, st in standard in many situations. He didn't want this. So he wrote a letter. He wrote a letter that said, essentially, I want to make clear that I don't want to die to the hospital. I don't, I'll go back to the hospital and I'm grateful for the hospital services where it uh, will provide me with something reversible, but I don't want to die in the hospital. He asks all the members of the family to sign it. 
he asked all of the home caregivers to sign it, and he took it to his physician and asked the physician to sign it too. Uh, and the physician thought about it, thought carefully about it, and signed it. Brooke knew he was lucky. And the message of this story here will be that he was able to have something that most people in most terminal situations and most of the things that we are ordinarily concerned with in death and dying issues, most people can't have. He knew he was lucky. He knew the very fine line between allowing to die and causing to die, which is at the core of the end of life debates. And he knew he had the legal and moral right to refuse or discontinue treatment he no longer wanted. The diaphragmatic pacer, the cardiac pacer, the feeding tube, the supplemental oxygen, and especially the ventilator which he did. He went to see his physician. The physician in these days of 15 minute clinic visits spent three hours with him, almost making sure that that was his genuine choice and ruling out all anything that could be a cause of a, an insincere choice. The physician was persuaded that this choice was genuine and that he would honor it. He referred Brooke to hospice. The hospice physician came and she spent extensive amount of time with him, listening to him, listening again, asking him again, thinking through with him these things. And finally she said, I will help you discontinue the ventilator. This is the photograph taken at the very moment at which she said that. This was such relief, such I think you have to say joy for him to know that he could be in charge of his own dying. And so, there was a humorous moment. This was in the morning. She said, I will help you. So he made some phone calls to old, she said, but you know, we, I have to go get some medications and arrange some things and I can come back at three o'clock in the afternoon. And he said, yes, yes. She asked me very carefully if I were opposed and I was able to say no. I understand that this is his choice. And then he said, well, wait a minute, we've done everything. We've made our wills. We bought cemetery plots a long time ago. We've um, figured out everything. We've seen the lawyers. We've done this. We've done that. But we never got around to picking out gravestone, gravestones, right? And it just so happens that we live, lived just a block or two above the near the graveyard and uh, the big Salt Lake Cemetery and near the um, little uh, gravestone place that makes uh, monuments, I think they're called. And so he, he goes, it's midsummer. It's this past July. He goes sailing out the door in his wheelchair, followed by a little procession of family, friends, right, caregivers, other people who showed up and he motors two blocks down and a block over to where the gravestone place is. Shopping, <laughs> shopping. Well, he can't point of course, but he can say, I see one two rows over and three, let's go look at that one. And no, I don't think that's it. I think this one, oh, well, no, that's not quite it. 
he'd spent a lot of time traveling around in the graveyard and looking at stones. And he picks one out. We're buying two, one for him and one eventually for me. He picks one out, I go in the little house to, you know, pay. And I'm in there doing the paperwork and I hear this call from outside, come out here, right? No, the one I've picked out isn't exactly the right one. I see another one, he can't point but he can say. I see, look, you know, three rows over and five to the left, right? And sure enough, that was the perfect one. So it goes back up the street where the hospice doc and the hospice nurse and two of our respir respiratory therapists are waiting for him. And his request is again formally witnessed by an independent party. And they introduce medications to calm and relieve anxiety and reduce air hunger and dial down the ventilator two breaths at a time from 18 breaths a minute to 16 breaths a minute to 14. And I lie in bed beside him and I can hear his breath slowing and the space between them gets longer and longer. And I know that one of them will be the last. And that was how he died. It was the way he wanted, with the control he wanted, with the people around him that he wanted, with the assistance of an extraordinarily caring physician and other extraordinarily committed and caring healthcare personnel. And in a way he knew that was not only better for him, but easier for everyone else, as hard as it might be, than many of the other ways we die at the end of long downhill declines. So that's the story. It's the end of a long love affair that began almost 40 years earlier and concluded in a way than which, given the circumstances, it's hard to imagine things any better. So thank you.